The Sassicus and the Albemarle, a paper read by Dr. Edgar Holden, late U.S. Navy, May 4th, 1887. Permit me to give you a description of what I believe to be the first deliberate attempt to destroy an ironclad by running it down with a wooden ship. On the 5th of May, 1864, the steamer Sassicus, one of several side-wheel ships built for speed, light draft, and easy maneuver in battle carrying four 9-inch Dahlgren guns and 200-pound parrot rifles, while engaged together with a Metatesset, Wyalusing, and several smaller vessels with the ironclad ram Albemarle and Albemarle Sound was under the heroism of Lieutenant Commander A.F. Rowe, and with all speed possibly attainable, driven down upon the ram, striking full and square at the junction of his armored roof and deck. Let me say at the outset distinctly that I do not attempt to describe the whole battle less than justice be done to gallant officers and men whose action did not fall under my immediate observation, but only to recall the part taken by the Sassicus in her attempt to run down the ram. It is somewhat shocking to one's faith in history to note how events of interest are made or marred by purely fortuitous circumstances, and how chance or the bias of the historian determines the distribution of honor and renown. Events in the life of nations as of men attain importance, moreover very much in proportion to their chance backgrounds or the state of the public mind at the time. The second battle with the Ram Albemarle occurred on the 5th of May, 1864, and on the day previous, General Grant began the movement of the armies of the Republic that the press and the people had long clamored for. Then followed the slaughter of the wilderness and the struggle of arms and military strategy, stretching on through Spotsylvania, North Anna, Cold Harbor, and the investment of Petersburg. Of course, public attention was absorbed for weary weeks and months, and when this foreground of flame and smoke and blood, all preceding events grew dim in the gray perspective of the past. To appreciate the motive that has actuated this reminiscence, one must go back to the date when ships in iron armor were first brought to the test of battle. We must look at the subject as we looked at it then, not only through the many hued glasses of youth, but as we now look at the innovations of recent date, although not even the new explosives, projectiles and submarine torpedoes which iron ships have made necessary to modern warfare, have so affected the relation of nations to each other as the advent of the iron ships themselves. Recall the discussions about the floating of a ship built of such massive weight and strength as shot-proof plates imply, of its withstanding a gale, of its maneuvering in battle, and especially of its ability to carry guns heavy enough to cope with an equally massive antagonist, for these and kindred questions filled the mind of an anxious and expectant people. To float was one thing, to fight quite another, and to sink easily was the most evident quality to the mind of all. Channel obstructions and torpedoes were rendered doubly formidable by the grim bugbear of unwieldiness and weight. The most amusing feature of the discussion of the day was that every civilian and private in the home guard knew all about it, and could tell you at once the thickness of plate necessary and the best style of ship to build. All this, of course, was brought about by the news from Hampton Roads in the gloomy days of March and April 1862, and that famous engagement began by my first experience, destined to be continued with ironclads throughout the war and all the vicissitudes of storm and battle. No one who was in that first eventful fight can ever forget the, the sensation experienced at the sight of the curling line of smoke over Sewell's Point Battery slowly moving across the brilliant noonday sky, nor the suppressed cry, the Merrimack is coming, as the drum beat to quarters and the long roll mingled with the rattling of cables and the unlimbering of heavy guns. A strange black roof monster gliding quickly out of the Elizabeth River, she carried to every mind the idea of overwhelming strength and, maj and majesty. When the second day's battle was over, and indeed for days and weeks afterward as we surveyed the devastation and wreck of that famous engagement, the one absorbing topic of conversation on the flagship Minnesota on deck in the wardroom over our after-dinner cigars was how best to meet and destroy the formidable ship. The wildest suggestions were made, and from dropping heavy anchors or torpedoes from the yards to throwing grenades down the smokestack, or the employment of Greek fire or Chinese pots, there gradually grew the conviction that ramming was the most feasible. Then came the old stories of shooting a tallow candle through a board and of a ferry boat in New York that had been driven 20 feet into a solid stone dock till the whole subject was worn threadbare, only to be renewed and gone over again. The matter took shape, however, and one fine morning, two or perhaps more, large ocean steamers came into the roads and anchored. But although naval officers had talked themselves into belief that a wooden ship was strong enough to sink an ironclad by its mere momentum, the feeling of others can be understood by an incident never before, I think, related. The captain of one of these steamers came promptly on board in the flagship to report for orders, clearly not being informed of the reason for bringing his ship under the eye of the grim Commodore Goldsboro. He was a weather-beaten but dignified sailor and had for years commanded with no, no one to question his authority. He was told in a few words what was expected of him. Keep up all steam and when the Merrimack comes out, run her down. Staggered a little by the command and the tone in which it was conveyed, he said, and this 
was what I came here for, to sink my ship on an ironclad? If you and your crew are killed, the government will take care of the widows and orphans. What has it become of mine? The tone of opposition exasperated the Imperius Commodore. Damn you, obey your orders. Never replied. Run down the ram yourself if you like. I return at once to New York. And amid a volley of sulfurous epithets, he went calmly over the side, and in an hour, a ship was outside the capes. This little episode was soon forgotten, and in spite of the easily propounded theories of destroying him, the ram came gaily out one day and coolly towed off several schooners, while our ships made ready for an attack which he had no mind to make. To attempt to run him down in a channel where there was no chance to maneuver would invite unpleasant results, and the chagrin of seeing him steam into the Elizabeth River with his prey may be imagined. The possibility of destroying an iron vessel by running her down with a wooden one probably wasn't unsettled, was as unsettled in the minds of officers of Merrimack as in our own, but without actual test, the conviction that it could be done grew and became general throughout our navy. A fair idea can be obtained of what such a process implies by remembering that on a ship in battle, you are on a floating target, through which the enemy's shell may bring not only the carnage of explosion but an equally unpleasant visitor, the sea. To hurl this eggshell target against a rock is suggestive. To hurl it against an ironclad bristling with guns, or to plant it upon the muzzles of hundred-pounder brooks or parrot rifles, with all the chance of a shearing off the ironclad and a subsequent ramming process about which no two opinions ever existed, is more than suggestive, but points to a de definite result. The first fair actual trial, therefore, in naval warfare with the clean run of a swift ship, with open throttles and oil in the fires, a square right-angle collision at the weakest part of the armor, and an engagement from... 4.40 till 8 p.m. is entitled to its proper place in history. And this was the way it came about. April 17, 1864, Plymouth, North Carolina. It was attacked by the Confederates and by land and river the ram Albemarle menacing the Union vessels Miami, Southfield, and Ceres. The two former being the larger vessels had been lashed together by the senior officer, Lieutenant Commander Flusser, for better resistance in the fight that was imminent. At early daylight on the 19th, the ram was signaled as coming and orders were given to ship housers to run her down. In less than two minutes from the time she was sighted, the ram's prow struck the port bow of the Miami, and the shearing slightly penetrated the starboard bow of the south field, sinking her immediately. The lashing cables parted, and Lieutenant Commander Flusser, who had been full of confidence in his ability to seek the ram, was killed by fragments of his own heavy nine inch shells rebounding from the iron roof of his antagonist, only a few feet from his guns. The other ship, Miami, was withdrawn from the doom that seemed inevitable, and the proposed running down process had been accomplished by the ironclad and not by the wooden ships. Sixteen days after this, the Albemarle came down the river with a steamer bombshell and the steamer cotton plant, laden with the troops and the gunboats, Metatesset, Sassicus, and Wyalusing, together with the smaller vessels Whitehead, Miami, and Ceres, and Commodore Hall steamed up to give battle. The actual number of guns carried by the formidable array of Union vessels I cannot give, the three larger vessels carried in all, twelve nine-inch Dahlgrens and six hundred pound parrot rifles. It would be evident that the confidence of the officers of the ram and the power of any wooden ship to run him down was certainly very small. Compare with that of our naval department, for he advanced with a dauntless bearing of invincibility. The plan of attack was for the large vessels to pass as close as possible to the ram without endangering their wheels, deliver their fire, and then round to in return. The smaller vessels were to take care of 30 armed launches, which were expected to accompany the ironclad. The Miami carried a torpedo to be exploded under the enemy, and a strong net or seen to foul his propeller. And it may be well to say here that both these failed, as they usually do in actual engagement. Something is always out of gear at the critical moment. It is difficult to direct the torpedoes or the unwieldy and dangerous articles inconveniently poked into a friendly ship, or exploded prematurely. Hand grenades were ready for the enemy's smokestack, which is never, of course, left open to receive them, but it sounds well to have them, though rarely of any service. All eyes were fixed on the second Merrimack as like a floating fortress that came down the bay. A puff of smoke from her bow port opened the ball, followed quickly by another. The shells aimed skillfully at the parrot rifle of the leading ship, Metatesset cutting away sail and spars and wounding six men at the guns. The ram then headed straight forward in imitation of the Merrimack, but by a skillful management of the helm, the Meditesset rounded his bows, closely followed by our own ship, the Sassicus, which at close quarters gave him a broadside a solid nine-inch shot. The guns might as well have fired blank cartridges, for the shot skimmed off into the air, and even the hundred-pound solid shot from the pivot rifle glanced from the sloping roof into space with no apparent effect. The feeling of helplessness that came, comes over from the failure of heavy guns to make any mark on an advancing foe can never be described. You are like a man with a bodkin before a gorgon or a dragon, a man with straws for the wheels of a juggernaut. To add to the feeling in this instance, the rapid firing from the different ships, the clouds of smoke, the changes of position to avoid being run down, the watchfulness to get a shot into ports of the ram, so quickly open to deliver their well-directed fire, 
kept alive the constant danger of our ships frying into or entangling each other. The crash of bulwarks and rending of exploding shells, which were fired by the ram, which were utterly useless to fire from our own guns, gave the confused sensation of a general and promiscuous melee, rather than their well-ordered attack. Yet, hopeless as it seemed, the plan was being carried out. Our own ship delivered a broadside and fired the pivot rifle with great rapidity, at roof and port and hull and smokestack to find a weak spot. He headed for us and nearly passed our stern as we were under full headway. He was foiled in this attempt and swiftly rounding him with a hard port helm we delivered the broadside of his consort, Bombshell, each shot hauling her. We now headed for her, going with an hail. Thus far our pivot rifle action had been had but small chance to fire and the captain of the gun, a broad-shouldered brawny fellow was now wrought up to a pitch of desperation and holding his great gun in leash. As we came to the bombshell he mounted the rail and neck into the waist he branched a huge cutlass and shouted, Haul down your flag and surrender, you brass-bound sons of whores, or we'll blow you out of the water. The flag came down, and she was ordered to drop out of action and anchor, which she did. Of this surrender, I shall have more to say farther on. Now came the decisive moment, for by this action, which was in reality a maneuver of our commander, we had acquired a distance from the ram about 400 yards, and he, to evade the metatessit, had sheared off a little and lay broadside to us. The Union ships were now on both sides of him with the engine stopped. Commander Rowe saw the opportunity which an instant's delay would forfeit, and boldly met the crisis of the engagement. To the engineer he cried, Crowd, waste, and oil in the fires, and back slowly. To acting officer Botel, he said, Lay our course for the junction of the casemate and the hull. Then came four bells, and with full steam and open throttle, the ship sprang forward like a living thing. There was a moment of intense strain and anxiety. The gun ceased firing, the smoke lifted from the ram, and we saw that every effort was being made to evade the shock. Straight as an arrow, we shot forward to the designated spot. Then came the order, all hands lie down, and with a crash that shook the ship like an earthquake, we struck full and square on the iron hull, careening her over and tearing away our own bows, ripping and straining our timbers at the waterline. The enemy's lights were put out, and his men hurled from their feet, and as we learned afterward, thought for a moment that it was all over with them. Our ship quivered for an instant, but held fast, and the swift splash at the paddles showed that the engines were uninjured. My own station was in the bow on the main deck, on a line with the enemy's guns. Through the port shutter, which had been partly jarred off by the concussion, I saw the port of the ram not ten feet away. It opened like a flash of lightning. I saw the grim muzzle of a cannon, the straining gun's crew naked to the waist and blackened with powder. Then a blaze, a roar, and a rush of shells that crashed through, whirling me around and dashing me to the deck. Both ships were under headway, and as the ram advanced, our shattered bows cling to the iron casemate, were twisted round in a second shot from a Brooks gun, almost touching our side, crashed through, followed immediately by a cloud of steam and boiling water. That filled the forward decks as our overcharged boilers, pierced by the shot, emptied their contents with a shrill scream that drowned for an instant the roar of the guns. Then the shouts of the command and the cries of scalded, wounded, and blinded men mingled with the rattle of small arms that told of a hand to hand combat above. The ship surged heavily to port as the great weight of the water in the boilers was expended, and over the cry, the ship is sinking, came the hoarse shout, Borders away! The men below, wild with the boiling steam, sprang to the ladder with pistol and cutlass and gained the bulwarks. But men in the rigging with muskets and hand grenades and the well-directed fire from the crews of the guns soon baffled the attempt of the Confederates to leave the ram to gain our decks, and on the grated top of the ironclad it would have been madness to send our crew. The horrid tumult, always characteristic of battle, was intensified by the cries of agony from the scalded and frantic men. Wounds may run then blood flow and grim heroism keep the teeth set with the silence. As we boiled alive to have the flesh drop from the face and hands to strip off and sodden mass from the body, as the clothing is torn away in savage eager for relief, will bring screaming from the stoutest lips. In the midst of all this, when every man above the engine rooms, our chief engineer, Mr. Hobby, although badly scalded, stood with heroism in his post, nor did he leave it till after the action when he was brought up blinded and helpless to the deck. I had often before been in battle had stepped over the decks of a steamer in the Merrimack fight when a shell exploded covering the deck with fragments of human bodies, literally tearing the pieces of the men in the small vessel as she lay alongside the Minnesota. But I never before experienced such sickening sensations of horror as when we lay for 13 minutes on the roof of the Albemarle. An officer of the Wyatt Loosing says that when the dense smoke and steam enveloped us, they thought we had sunk till the flash of our guns burst through the clouds, followed by flash after flash in quick succession as our men recovered from the shock of the explosion. We were not the senior ship, and in the report of the battle, the time of our contact was said to be a few minutes. Great heavens, was there any use in belittling this heroic attempt to save the nation's honor? There was time enough for the other ships, only three minutes away, to close in on the ram and sink her, or sink beside her, and it was thirteen minutes, 
as time by an officer who held his watch in hand and told me with his own lips. But the other ships were silent and with stopped engines looked on as the clouds closed over us in the grim and final struggle. Captain French of the Miami, who had bravely fought his ship at close quarters and often at the ship's length, vainly tried to get bows on to come to our assistance and use his torpedo. But his ship steered badly and was unable to reach us before we dropped away. In the meantime, the wire loosing signaled that she was sinking. A mistake, but one that affected materially the outcome of the battle. The naval report further says, after remaining in contact some few minutes, she disengaged herself, meaning our ship. Soon afterward, it is late justice now after 23 years to give the true history of this battle, but it is full time that the heroism of Lieutenant Commander F.A. Rowe received recognition. During those 13 minutes, he held the unequal fight with the coolness and bravery to which your esteemed treasurer, George DeForest Barton, can testify, for he stood by his side, acting as signal officer, and was honorably mentioned in Commander Rowe's report. We had struck exactly at the spot for which we had aimed, and the contrary of the diagram given in the naval report for that year, the headway of both ships, our engines running on a vacuum, twisted our bows and brought us broadside to broadside, our bows at his stern and our starboard paddle wheels on the forward starboard angle of his casemate. To this as against the report mentioned, I not only attest from my own observations, but I have in my possession the written statement of the navigator, Boutel, now member of Congress from Maine. We drifted off the ram in our pivot gun, which had been fired incessantly by Ensign Mayer, almost muzzle to muzzle with the engine's guns, was kept at work till we were out of range. Official report says that the other ships were then got in line and fired at the enemy, also attempting to lay the scene to foul his propeller. The task had proved, alas, as impractical as that of injuring him by the fire of the guns. For while we were alongside and had drifted broadside to broadside, our nine-inch Dahlgren guns had been depressed till the shot was struck at right angles, and the solid iron would bound from the roof into the air like marbles. And with this little impression, Fragments even of our 100-pound rifle shots at close range came back on our own decks. The fight was practically over when our boilers burst and in dust the ram steamed into the Roanoke River. I have said in the beginning that the historical importance of this event has been overshadowed by the long-looked-for movements of the great armies of the Republic and dwelt upon the effect of this purely fortuitous coincidence. The one circumstance which would have blazoned the heroism of Commander Rowe in spite of this was the failure of the other ships to come to his assistance during the long 13 minutes that the Sasakis lay over the ports of the Albemarle. Yet no one can believe that there was lack of courage on the part of the other ships. The loss of the south field, the signal from the Wyalusing that she was sinking, the apparent loss of our ship and the loss of the sounds of North Carolina if more disabled dictated the prudent course they adopted. But of the official reports which belittled the achievements of Commodore Rowe and have placed an erroneous record on the page of history, I cannot speak so leniently. He was asked to correct his report as to the speed of our ship. He said we were going to a, at a speed of 10 knots and the official report says he was not disposed to make the correction. I should think not when the speed could only have been estimated by his own officers, and the navigator says clearly in his port 11 knots. We had perhaps the swiftest ship in the Navy. We attacked slowly to increase the distance, with furious fires and a gagged engine working at the full stroke of the pistons. A run of over 400 yards, with eager and excited men counting the revolutions of our paddles, who should give the more correct statement. The senior ship, Menetessa, at first on the line, claimed to capture the bombshell. The captain of said vessel, afterward a prisoner on our ship, said he surrendered to the second ship in the line, uh, the Sasakus, that the flag was not hauled down till he was ordered to, by, to do so by Commander Rowe, and that no surrender had been intended till the order came from the second vessel in the line. Another part of the official report which, to which ex exception is taken is that the bows of the double enders were all frail, and had they been armed would have been sufficient to sink the ram. If this had been so, then the heroism of the trial would have been the greater, but our bow was shot with a bronze beak, weighing fully three tons, well secured to prow and keel and this was twisted and almost entirely torn away by the collision. But what avails it to you as a soldier to dash over the parapet and seize the colors of the enemy if your regiment halts outside the Cheval de Free? It was this we did, and we've always felt that a similar blow on the other side or close environment of the heavy guns of the other ships could have captured or sunk the ram. He retired never again to emerge from battle for the Roanoke River, and the object of his coming the day of our engagement to aid the Confederates in an attack on New Bern was defeated but his ultimate complete destruction was reserved for Lieutenant William B. Cushing of glorious memory.